Good afternoon or morning, wherever it may be for you, and welcome to Ozark Bethel Chapel Live. No, we're not actually live with you. We are live recorded. I'm alive, the church is alive, and we're thankful for what, for what God is doing. We're glad to have you here again with us. We were with you last week as we did our first uh, recorded service in the midst of this COVID-19 outbreak and, and the restrictions that have been put upon us. Today I'm here in my church sanctuary recording, praying that you and yours are doing well. I pray that none of you are dealing with the sickness uh, of COVID-19 or anything else. I hope you took advantage before this uh, of watching the worship music that we recorded for you. Uh, if not, uh, we sent you a link and it is available. It should be right there close to this YouTube video as well. Uh, if you haven't, I encourage you to do that, to watch it before you even watch this, to kind of prepare your heart uh, through a time of worship, just a couple of songs there, not as lengthy as it was last week, uh, but just to kind of prepare you for the presence of God to hear from his word today. Uh, I hope that you've been trying to submit to the guidelines that have been laid down by our political as well as our spiritual leaders, uh, both local and national. Uh, I believe it's for our health and our well-being. We're trying to abide by that. I do want to encourage you to invite your friends and neighbors uh, by text, by telephone call to watch our, our videos. Uh, if they're not in church someplace, uh, if they're not attached to a church, this is a great time, a great place for them to just view there in the comfort of their own living room. And if possible, as we asked last week, if you'd respond to this video just by sending myself or my wife a, a short message, a text message saying, hey, we watched the video, whatever it may be. We're not looking for, for your praise or approval, but just for your participation to know one of our church family and others who are watching this. So feel free to uh, send us a text. My, my text number, 573-421-3554. Uh, we would appreciate that very much. We hope that uh, next week things will be different, that we can be back to our service right here in the church. If not, uh, we are going to maybe try something different. We've heard of churches doing uh, parking lot services, and so uh, we may try to do that next week. But even if we do that, we may record it so that we can be live as well. Um, uh, at worst, we'll be right here, uh, right back here doing this recording as this. Um, let me remind you... Uh, that trying to pay attention to my notes misprint there i wanted to remind you that we are available my wife and i are very much available to you whether it's by phone uh texting or a phone call either way we're, we're available if you need an errand run if you need somebody to run into town and get something for you you're afraid to get out uh especially our senior adults we are available to do that. Uh, maybe you just need a conversation with somebody. I've been trying to make some phone calls, uh, not been able to have much luck there. Uh, people not answering their phone, but busy, whatever's going on in their own lives. But if you need just conversation, feel free to call myself or Marty. If you've got a prayer request, whatever the need may be, don't, don't hesitate. You're not a bother. I often hear people say, Pastor, you're so busy. We are not so busy that we can't stop uh, whatever we're doing, and, and maybe that's just sitting relaxing, but we'd be glad to talk with you for a few minutes, whatever it may be. But before I get into the word today, I want to encourage you in another area, and that's in, in being faithful in your giving. You know, uh, we may have a pause in our weekly attendance because of the uh, COVID-19 epidemic, but the, his, the kingdom of God is still moving forward. The kingdom of God is still at work. Our place in this kingdom has not changed just because we can't meet together as a body of Christ for a short period of time. We know this isn't permanent. It's just a short time. But uh, our responsibilities within the kingdom of God remain the same as they have always been. And part of that responsibility is for us to pay our tithes and to meet our, our vows that we have made, whether it's to missions or, or some other area of the kingdom of God. So as he is faithful, I pray that you would remain faithful as well. You can mail in your, your, uh, your tithes, your offerings, whatever, to the church address, 10348 State Road J, Ozark Bethel Chapel, uh, here in Roach, Missouri, 65787. You can mail that in, 
or you can drop it off if you're in the area you can slip it in the mailbox we check the mailbox we try to every single day and bring the offerings and bring as well uh, the uh, mail in so feel free to do that or you can knock on our front door if you want to do that as well uh, but we, 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 well, we want you to be remain faithful in this now, before we get started, let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer today. We just want to pray for our nation, for individuals. And so we just ask you to bow with us in prayer. Father, as we come together right now in the name of Jesus, I may be here in this sanctuary alone by myself, but Father, I believe that you are here. Your presence is here. You said where two or three were gathered together. Father, we're as together as we can be today. Father, by video, and we pray for the anointing and the power, the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray for your anointing upon me as I bring forth your word. God, do not let me stand here in my own strength, my own disabilities, Father, but God, may your ability flow through me. May the anointing, the power, the wisdom, the knowledge of the Holy Spirit work in and through me today. And Father, in every home, in every household, every place where this video is being watched, I pray Holy Spirit, that you would draw it near to those who are watching. God, and that you would pour out your spirit upon them and give them ears to hear. Lord, may their hearts be made sensitive to hear what the word of God is saying, the instruction, uh, Lord, the teaching, the training and righteousness. God, give us ears to hear, we pray today. Father, as well, we pray for your work in the world, uh, the, the, this COVID-19 ep epidemic, Lord, that's not just affecting us, but affecting our entire world. Father, we pray that you would bring an end to it. We pray for your mercy and for your grace. Father, that you would give doctors and, and researchers, uh, Father, insight into what can be done to stop this epidemic. Uh, Lord, medicines that, that have already been seen to be effective, God, that they might be given approval to move forward. Father, may you work in these things. Give our national leaders, the president, father, and the surgeon general, and all those who are involved, give them wisdom in the decisions that they are making. I pray, Father, for our spiritual leaders, for my spiritual leaders, for Pastor Don Miller, the district superintendent for our district. Father, I pray that you give him wisdom. Our governors, Father, and mayors, people who are in leadership everywhere, give them wisdom wisdom and direction, Lord, in the decisions they're making. Father, I pray especially for the growth of your kingdom during this time of testing. Father, it has often been that during times of trouble and trial and persecution, and, and though I don't see this as a time of persecution, it is a time of, of trial. God, that in the midst of this, Father, uh, the kingdom would grow as it has done for in many times in the past. Lord, we love you and we're looking for this. We pray for the health of our congregants, Lord, of the people of our church, our family. God, that you would protect them, Lord, especially our seniors and those who may have health issues. Protect them. God, that this disease would not come near them, not near their household today. And Father, that you would deliver. Heal those who are battling sickness of any kind. We pray for your touch and your anointing upon them. And Father, today we pray especially for peace in the midst of turmoil, peace in the midst of, of abnormality that's going on in our lives. God, we, we ask that the peace of God that passes all understanding would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we love you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Jesus Christ, you are Lord of all. You are our God. You are our Messiah, our Savior. Lord, we're trusting in you today. We praise you and exalt you. In Jesus' name, we lift this prayer. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You know, today we do indeed live in troubled times. Uh, we live in a time of disaster, the COVID-19 issue that's going on all around us, as well as uh, the threats of terrorism that are in our world today, economic distress, uh, especially that is taking place in, in our nation throughout the world because of COVID-19, but other reasons as well. 
the threat of socialism to our nation today, uh, so-called things like climate change, threats from foreign governments that may be coming against us, uh, illegal immigration issues, on and on and on we could go with the issues. I just received a, a, a survey in the mail and was talking about some of these issues and how we thought about them. We are living in troubled times for sure. So where do we find peace when we are confronted with such issues on a daily basis? It's so easy to become, some, to become anxious, to become fretful, uh, disturbed over these issues because we hear about them, whether it's on the television news or on the radio news, the talk show hosts, even music stations that, that mention these things. There's no way of escaping from it in any way. But I believe that God has an answer. I believe that he has a, a formula for peace. So today I wanna to share with you in these troubled times, God's formula for peace in troubled times. We're going to look today in the book of, uh, of Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. It reads like this, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. God's formula for peace in the time of trouble. It begins with rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Even in the midst of unsettling circumstances, we have much to rejoice about. Can I tell you that God is for us? <laughs> Hallelujah. God is for us. He is not against us. God is not out to destroy us, but as I spoke last week, he is out to draw us near. God has eternally saved us if we have believed on Jesus Christ. He has promised us a home in heaven. Hallelujah. He is our God. As I spoke last week, he will either protect us from the dangers and the troubles, or he will bring us through those things if need be. And even perhaps he might use them to bring us to himself, to our home, to our reward in heaven. But we have reason to rejoice for far more than we have reason to fear. So I tell you today, do not be humdrum, do not be defeated, do not be destroyed, but instead rejoice in the God of your salvation. Secondly, I want to say to you today, let go of the trouble. Release it from your minds. In the verses preceding this, verse 2 and 3 of chapter 4 of Philippians, I didn't read it today, but in those verses, the Apostle Paul addresses two ladies within the church who were having conflict, who were having trouble, who were at disagreements with one another. And in verse 5, he tells them, and he tells us as well, he says, let your forbearing spirit be known to or, or be seen by all. That word forbearing spirit, in other translations, says let your gentle spirit. In others, it says let your moderation be known. The, the Greek word there that's translated all these different ways, it means to be non-judgmental, to be unwilling to lay blame or to make accusation. It's the idea of, of not placing blame, but bearing with one another. You know, it's so easy to look at others and to point at their problems or their faults. It's, it's easy to look at our nation and point at all the issues and all the problems. But this is saying, instead of doing that, bear with those issues. Learn to be gentle toward those who contradict you. Act with moderation instead of with anger or dispute or even sadness or sorrow. Let there be moderation. Instead of letting the heights be so high or the low so low, act with moderation. 
Too, too often we hold on to trouble in our lives with, with worry or anger, with bitterness, with fret or with fear, with anxiety, when instead we just need to learn to, to let it go. Why? Because the Lord is near. First of all, he can handle it. He can either make the necessary judgment that it's not my place to make. I'm thankful. Oh, so many times I've, I've said, thank you, God, that I'm not the judge. The, the word of God says, judge not lest you be judged. For in the same way you judge, you will be judged. I'm thankful I'm not the judge. I don't want to be the judge. I learned a long time ago uh, to learn to be merciful. Why? Because I need, if there's anybody, I need God's mercy. So don't judge, don't get upset with others, don't get upset with the situation. God is near, he can handle it, he can handle it. But what we need to do is merely rest and rejoice in Christ our Lord, in God our maker. So, so I, according to this scripture today, I encourage you to just let it go, let it go. There's a, Disney song, I'm not going to try to sing it for you today. Just let it go. Whatever it is that's causing you a lack of peace in your life. Anger at somebody that's bringing bitterness. And bitterness is a lack of peace. Whether it's anxiety about what's going on around us, let it go. Let the anxiety and the fear go. Thirdly, turn it over to God. Give it, give it to God today. You know, we give it to him through prayer and petition. That's what it says here. Let your prayers, let your, your requests and your petitions be known unto God. Put every situation into God's hands as you let it go. Don't just throw it off anywhere, no, but give it to God who's able to handle that thing. Tell God about your needs. Tell God about your frustrations. Tell God about your fears or your anxieties. I remember as a, as a young child, a young man uh, singing an old song in the church that said, take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Another old song that probably more are familiar with, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Give it to God. Give your situation to God and leave it there. Too often we pick it up again. We try to walk away with it, leave it at God's feet. And perhaps as a sign of your trust in God, as you leave it there, begin to give thanks. Let your prayers and petitions be made with thanksgiving. Thankfulness that God's going to take care of it. Thankfulness for God's ability to take care of it, that he can handle it. Thankfulness for God's love and care in your life, that he cares enough. Cast your care upon me, the Bible says, for I care for you, hallelujah. Thankfulness in advance, before you see the work done. Thankfulness that God is going to do what is necessary to bring you through. Give it to God with thanks as you rejoice in the God of your salvation. You know, none of these, th these three things simply happen. They are decisions that you choose and actions that you must do. Choose to rejoice and then do it. Go ahead and rejoice. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. God, I'm thankful. Choose to do it and then do it. Choose to let trouble go and then do it. Let it go. Choose to trust in God. Trust is not anxiety. Fear and faith are opposite things. When you're walking in faith, fear must flee. Choose to trust God and do it. Don't just think about it. Don't just talk about it, but do it. This is God's formula for guarding our hearts and minds. Do these things, he says, and it will guard your hearts and minds with peace. Peace in Jesus Christ. But there's, there's still more. There's one more thing that's a part of this formula for peace in the times of trouble and that's discipline disciplining your thoughts disciplining your mind rather than letting every situation and every circumstance dictate your thought life and your emotions discipline your thought your 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 thought life to dwell on the good things instead of dwelling on the bad dwell on the good things dwell upon the truth what you know to be true, not the lies, not, not the speculations. Our speculations, you know, the, the what ifs, 
well, what if this happens or what if this happens or what suppose this or suppose that our speculations are quite often just Satan's lies trying to tear us down. He can immobilize us with, with speculations that have absolutely no basis in fact or in truth. They're just vain imaginations that, that run through our mind and we, we dwell on those things. It's so easy. I, I find myself sometimes wondering about what I would do. This is a good thought perhaps, but what I would do if I won the lottery. Now, first of all, it's gonna be very difficult because I've never bought a lottery ticket in my life. Uh, I think I've had a couple given to me as a prize someplace and I've rubbed those off. But you know, I've, I've thought, what, what would it be like to, to win a, a million or 10 million or a hundred million dollars? And, and I've, I've let my mind go and then suddenly I stop and I think, stop, what are you doing? You're, you're, that's not gonna happen. That's not my hope, my hope is in Jesus Christ. Don't dwell on the lies and the speculations of the enemy. Dwell on truth. Let your mind dwell on honorable and noble characteristics in people's lives. Even the worst people have some good characteristics. Dwell on those. Dwell upon the honorable and noble things and situations rather than all the, the faults and the failures that are taking place around us. You know, good leaders make bad mistakes sometimes but instead of focusing on the the wrongs focus on the good focus on the right things of this world the pure and clean things rather than all the impure thing that is thrown into our lives every day as we watch the television listen to the radio read a magazine look at the billboards drive it there's no way to escape it but instead of focusing on the evil and the bad and the wrong look to the good that may be there. Look to the things that are reputable, well spoken of, whether it's people, institutions, think on those things, rather than the things that cause you offense, rather than the things that, that, that are questionable. You know, often what we hear in, in our modern media, whether it's television news or, or, or sitcoms or movies or biographies, or whatever it may be whether when we hear those things we often are hearing lies or evils or wrongs or filth whatever it may be and I, yesterday we were watching the television and there was a commercial on of all things a commercial it was a commercial for some cop show some series uh, police show and in that commercial, in the commercial itself, there were at least three or four car explosions where a, a vehicle, huge explosion. And I asked my wife, I said, how often do you ever hear in the news of a car explosion? How often do you see breaking news, a car in downtown Springfield exploding? You just, it's very, I don't know that I've ever heard of it. But simply from that commercial, I couldn't believe the car explosions. I mean, three or four of them there, just one right after the other. It would have made you believe that it's just a common everyday thing, car explosions. We're lied to. We're led astray. So we have to be careful about what we let in, what we bring in to our mind. And I want to say this, seeing it or hearing it doesn't necessarily mean that you're letting it in. If that was letting it in, we would have to go around with our ears closed, or, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. We can't do that. But we must discipline our minds to filter out the wrong, to not dwell on it, to filter out the impure, to filter out the unjust, the lies. You could ask my children about that filtering out process. Anytime we're watching television and some Whatever it is, it can be in a sitcom, it can be in a bio, biography, a science, it can be whatever. And they begin to talk about millions and billions of years. I will out loud say that's a lie because it is. There haven't been millions of years. If there's been millions of years, they, they occurred according to what a lot of people want to say in the days of creation that weren't really days, they were millions of years. And if that's true, then there was lots of, of sin and death before the garden, but the Bible says that death came about because of sin in the garden of Eden. There's no way there's millions and billions of years before the creation according to the word of God and how it says it. 
That's just one instance of not letting it in. I hear it. I see it proposed everywhere. You can walk to a, a national park, state park, and, and they'll tell you about the millions of years it took for the erosion or the building up to make this land thing, whatever. They'll, it's not true. It's coming at us, but it doesn't have to get into us. Instead, Scripture tells us to, to practice or to dwell on in your thoughts, in your words, your deeds. To practice, Paul says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen. Listen to that again. What you have learned, what you've received, what you've heard, and what you've seen from God's word and from godly leadership. Practice. Do these things. What the word of God teaches us to do. And it teaches us, teaches us to discipline our thoughts. To reject the wrong and to dwell upon the right. We've got to follow through with right actions, not merely intentions. I want to show you this passage of scripture found in 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 and 5. It says, for the weapons of our warfare, our spiritual warfare, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What are those weapons? Part of it is this. We are destroying speculations, imaginations, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And listen, we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Disciplining our thought life. Where we're letting our mind dwell. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says this. For God has not given us the spirit of, of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. That's the King James Version. And that word I've got under the line there, sound mind. Most of us hear that and we think it's talking about the power of God, the love of God, and to have a, a mind that's not insane, a sound mind. But that's not what that sound mind means at all. The, the New American Standard says it this way. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, being timid, but of power and love and discipline. There's that word, discipline. The Bible in basic English says it this way. God did not give us a spirit of, of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Controlling our own thought lines. And then God's word. God did not give us cow a cowardly spirit, but a spirit of power, love, and good judgments. Disciplining our thought life. The day in which we live is one that lends itself. I believe, according to Satan's schemes and designs, it lends itself to fear and anxiety. That's where Satan would have us live, in a place of fear and anxiety. Whether it's over COVID-19, or whether it's about terrorism, whether it's the constant news that we see on, this, on, the, on the television, the, the crime and the evil, the disasters that are everywhere. I understand when disaster takes place. I want to hear about it. I, and maybe there's something that we can do to help. But those disasters, I don't watch. And then in fear that that tornado, that hurricane, that earthquake, that lightning strike, whatever it is, that it's going to suddenly be upon me. Speculations of things like aliens. Speculations of giant meteors that's going to wipe us out. Speculations of climate change that's going to destroy our, our, our planet. Speculations of the zombie apocalypse. Whatever it may be. We hear about the terror by day and the terror by night. I believe the Bible talks about. Satan wishes to destroy us. To, to reduce us into fear and anxiety. To pain caused by our own thought life. But I want you to know today. God has created us for life. He has created us for life and life to the full, the Bible says. He filled us with his life. He breathed into us the breath of life there in the Garden of Eden. He, he gave us great intellect. He gave us great emotions. He gave us great abilities to be able to experience life, to enjoy life to the full. He gave us this amazing world that we live in, even though it's been touched by sin it's been tainted by sin it's still an amazing world it's given us the ability to rule over this world so that we might have life to the full i'm so thankful for all that god has given us he created us for life but satan came to steal to kill and to destroy all that god has given to us he did that by leading us into temptation and into sin in the in the garden of eden 
He brought us to a place of disobedience of God's commands. Satan tempted us and caused us to reject God's love and God's goodness, doubting that God was good all the time. Brought us to a place of brokenness in our relationship with God. God, the one who is the source of our life, broke off it from relationship with him. That's what happened because of sin. It was Satan's scheme, Satan's plan, but I want you to know, God was aware of Satan's schemes. Hallelujah. God was aware and God made a way for us to be forgiven of our disobedience and our rebellion. He made a way for us to once again receive God's love and God's goodness, to know what it's all about. He made a way to be restored to a right relationship with God once again. Hallelujah. That where I am, there you may be also, Jesus said. Praise his name. He sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in us. We could never reach up to God in our fallen condition. No way that we could reach God. But hallelujah, God could reach down to us. So he came to earth as a man. Jesus Christ came to earth. The son of God came to live as a man, fully man, absolutely sinless life of, of God in the flesh. He was undeserving of any kind of punishment or wrath from God. He never spoke a word of, of hurt or harm or, uh, to bring sin into his life. He never acted. He never thought in sinful ways in any way. He did not deserve any kind of punishment for sin or, or the wrath of God in any way. He was undeserving of death or destruction. He was undeserving of being in any way separated or cut off from God the Father. But yet he took our sin, my sin and your sin. He not only took our sin, he took the punishment for that sin. He took the rejection that we deserve to be cut off from God. Instead, Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried out upon the cross because of my sin. He took our place. Listen to me today. He took our place and he gave us his place instead. We became the loved and accepted children. For as many as believe in him, as many as receive Jesus, to them he gave the right to be called the sons and the daughters, the children of God. He took our place as the sinner and gave us his place as children of God. Hallelujah. Now through faith in Jesus Christ, we can be restored to the abundant life that we were created for. Or we can reject Jesus Christ and accept the eternal consequences for our sin ourselves. And that eternal consequence is damnation of hell. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it. But those who reject Jesus Christ, those who do not accept him as Lord and Savior, will spend eternity in hell. God's formula, God's means for salvation today begins with believing in Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. Believing in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Believing that he died on the cross in your place and in my place for the forgiveness of sin. Secondly, not only to believe that, but to repent, to change directions, to be 